working. After that, I think we met maybe in, I don't know, 2014 or something like that. Yeah, or, or maybe even 12 or something. Or 12, yeah. And we've been working ever since um, in uh, things uh, related to text mining, modeling, and gene regulation. Rune has been also working for a long time with Astrid. Uh, he's a philosopher. Also, I think you have a training in as a physicist, right? But uh, so it's a uh, quite an odd thing. So uh, I believe Rune approached uh, Astrid because uh, you were interested in um, in how knowledge and uh, is is uh, acquired in in experimental laboratories and. Uh, Astrid at that time was uh, setting up the national infrastructure for microarray technologies in Norway. So they started their conversation. You were doing a, a PhD thesis on the topic. And they've been working there ever since. Uh, when I was employed uh, by the uh, NTNU, uh, you had this uh, group, a uh, very un uh, multidisciplinary group uh, for, uh, it was called uh, Drug Logics about uh, investigating drugs in oncology. And so there were experimentalists, computational people, and uh, people from humanities, which is, I think, a very unique thing. So um, they're going to talk about uh, the, this uh, intersection between uh, philosophy and uh, experimental things. I'm just going to give the room to them. And I hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you, Mikael. Thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, just before Rune gets us uh, going, we thought we'd ask how many of you work in the wet lab on a weekly basis? For those sitting. Okay. How many of you work exclusively in computation? Okay. So in the audience, maybe then Alfonso is the only one who's actually worked in a lab. Or at least uh, not, not anymore on a daily basis. But so then let me just turn around a bit. How many of you worked in a wet lab before? Okay. So there are a lot of people who know both sides, which is good. It's easier to talk to. Anyone here from the humanities or social sciences? Uh, so. Good. So, Rune, I think we're ready to go. Okay. Um, I have tried to introduce some of these concepts uh, that we will be using when Astrid turns uh, next to speak of the specific practices. So I'll just comment first on, on this very question, what is a systems biology laboratory? So, it's um, what what our question is and why we ask it. Uh, a laboratory is different things. A, a physics laboratory and a biology laboratory are of course different things because they are interested in different things. So uh, a laboratory is, is, uh, depends and is designed for a specific uh, epistemic objective. So there looks different and they are designed also comes with a different type of culture and different type of social and material culture. So they're different. But the point we are interested in here is not that they are made over time. They, be, they become. They are uh, not ready-made. And we are interested in, in the systems biology as a laboratory that comes from somewhere. More specifically, we discuss it as uh, re-engineering of the molecular biology laboratory. So you have the molecular biology laboratory that has are still in transition. That's our claim. So the systems biology, what it is, it is something, whatever it is, it's something that we are interested in as a practice that is becoming, that it is underway. And as more specifically as, as a reconstruction of the <coughs> molecular biology. So this is also to understand systems biology as an aspirational practice. It's um, um, 
And these aspirations, what it seeks to become, involves a radical transition in times, terms of the practice of what it is as a laboratory practice. So that's somehow our starting point. That this is, um, is it me who makes this? Um, and it, so we have been discussing uh, that it involves a radical shift and we're interested in this as a practice, as a way of, of, uh, of understanding these dynamics of these changes coming from one uh, laboratory to, to another. So given our claims, it's, it becomes in, important also to understand how it is the dynamics of these changes. So that's, that's our interest. And we're also then discussing, uh, uh, because we hope that these descriptions of, of a practice may provide some insight or, or enlighten the differences of um, the, the, the... We discuss it as activation of... of, of um, um, awareness of this substantial shift, assuming that there's not been awareness enough of the nature of this shift. And we also believe that it could help, or that's, that's our aim, to help understand the nature of the character of, of the, the, the challenges involved. And one way we do that in, in, in the humanities and social sciences, when we study and where we are interested in, in uh, understanding science as a practice and a culture is to do case studies. And here we have a wonderful case. I'm, I'm in the middle of a, been working with Astrid now for 25 years and she has underwent this transition and is in still in this transition. So we're simply just looking at, at the practice uh, and, and trying to describe the, the, these changes. So it's within this tradition of understanding science as a practice, as something that is always underway. And in this context, we, uh, we uh, uh, use iron hacking as um, one of our, our main theoretical um, uh, figures, um, notions of laboratory science and laboratory style of reasoning. It's a kind of technical co concept, a style of reasoning. Well, we could use the word style. But it is uh, a way of, of, of um, naming a specific type of science as having a specific type of, of reasoning style that enables them to reason well. Because the sciences, they are interested in different type of topics. And hacking is interested in how do you reason well to study that topic or that object. And that comes with different type of styles, so it also is a, a part of a, a diversity of the sciences and the particularity of their, the reasoning within the different sciences. That's one. But then again, uh, more specifically, it's a laboratory science. And the laboratory science has developed a specific way of discussing or investigating that one is interested in discussing. By creating a, a manipulating mach machinery in a specific room, and you take the object you want to study into that room, and then you m make it possible to manipulate that object within that space. So the laboratory sciences is very specifically uh, organized around the topic or the objects, the things that you want to investigate by creating that type of specific type of room. And then Hacking uh, calls that a specific type of, of that's a way of, of naming a science and the differences of the sciences of the laboratory sciences. And they are different, uh, although they share commonalities of course. but. The objects you br bring into the, to, to, to the laboratory space is not necessarily an object you find in nature, 
you may you and you remake it or you prepare it for a specific purpose. And you also make objects in the sciences or phenomena in the laboratory that doesn't exist anywhere else, like the laser or something. So the laboratory styles are field dependent and we are now moving to another of our, our uh, theoretical uh, background uh, uh, we, we rely on, and that is uh, Hans-Jörg Reinberger. He is a philosopher or a historian, or, but he also has been a practic practitioner molecular biologist. So he's reflecting on the work of the molecular biology laboratory. And we will rely on three aspects of the laboratory. The first one I've already discussed a little bit. That's laboratory as a working unit. And he describes this as uh, a specific design to uh, the, the laboratory unit is designed to give unknown answers to questions that the experiments themselves are not yet able to ask. So it's it's a way you make a, a, a specific space, technical, um, material, social, but still it's, it's a very, very specific design uh, around a specific object to study it. And uh, the questions you come with are themselves not possible to articulate clearly without this working with the objects in this technical environment. And second, it's field dependent objects. So if you do physics or if you do biology, you have different type of objects and that defines in turn the type of process, the type of activity that takes place in this, in this laboratory. Um, so the whole work is attuned to these objects studied and Reinberg is very much interested in these objects and I'll return to that in, in, in a second. And the third one is the research infrastructure. It's conditioning uh, a shared practice. So uh, laboratory comes with this, with a culture. It comes also with supporting infrastructure, social and technical. And this also have to be made, but it also conditions what one can do in the, the working unit. Uh, that's where the, uh, the epistemic work is, is primarily done, but it is supported by uh, um, infrastructures. And these infrastructures typically goes somehow in, into the background in the daily work. The better the experimental system is developed, the more you don't have to care about all this infrastructure that just provides you with it, what you need to be all, all involved in the epistemic work. So the problem is, is, and our main argument here, and what we're trying to establish, is that the shift is complicated and um, takes time because all these three elements are re-engineered simultaneously. So the space in which you can make reliable, viable epistemic claims, the experimental unit changes. Also the object you bring in and reflect on and manipulate, the process within this space changes and the infrastructure changes. And they're all interconnected. Um, so they all need to be mutually stabilized against each other. So the laboratory is a, is a it's what uh, we, uh, is a recurrent term in this literature is, is the notion of robustness or stabilization as a way of, of of, of as, as epistemic terms, so a result can be more or less robust, not necessarily 
it's as a way of, of not discussing it as truth or false, but it's it's reliable in the sense that it's it's robust against all these type of variations. So the last one I'll I'll do is just to speak a little bit of these objects because that's important for the argument of of, uh, of uh, the one we, we're we're making here. So we bring we I say. <laughs> The experimentalists or the laboratory scientists take objects into the the, the, the working unit, and uh, Reinberger calls this preparations. They are prepared typically in the molecular biology laboratory. It's clone mice, or it's a, it's a cell line, or it's 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 something that is prepared for this the purpose that you are interested in, and that he calls the epistemic object. It's the object of what you are, your desires to know, what you desire to know. And what you desire to know need to be part, it must be, um, the object you bring into the um, laboratory needs to contain that type of question or that, that object. It's not just in our mind, but it's also manifested in that object. So, not every object fulfills the purpose of what you want to know. So you have to, you have to choose your object with care, of course, the, the preparation. But then again, the process is, needs to maintain that thing you want to know by turning in, transforming a set of new objects. You make experiments and you get traces. You get traces of this something you are interested in knowing. And this trace needs to be there. Uh, so the epistemic object, what you want to know, needs to be manifested in those traces. If you're unable to make those traces in the correct way. If you're able to transform the preparation into viable traces that still contains the epistemic object. And then you have data about these thing you want to know and you make models modeling what you want to know. So these are specific objects and they are sometimes tangible and they are sometimes abstract but they still need could think of them as object that one can work on, move around or think about or configure. So the, 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 the process is a process he analyzed the working process in terms of these objects. And they need to have a, a status of a scientific object in the sense that they contain what you want to know. But they also need to be transformed. And then uh, we move forward to speak more about the story. Continuing where we left off, so I mean this is the this is the platform that we're standing on when we're trying to understand this transition or the recrafting. That's what I'm going to talk about. So our timeline is uh, 20, 25 years or so, or almost thirty years from starting to build up the, the a specific molecular biology laboratory until now, and. Um, we're going to try to refer to this timeline and uh, tell the story sort of as it goes on and use it to, to try to exemplify how the working unit changes, how the scientific objects and the process and dealing with them change and the, the changing culture and infrastructure. So, starting with the molecular biology, I came into a physiology laboratory and they wanted to know on a molecular basis, how does the hormone, the gastric hormone gas gastrin, how does it work? They knew it could stimulate proliferation. They uh, assumed it could play a role in, in, uh, in cancer. And they say, well, now tell us some molecular biology about it. So we had a model cell line, if AR42J, that responded to gastrin. And the question is, which molecules in, a, in molecular biology do we want to look for to, 
you know, help explain how, how Gastrian works. So, okay, we'll, we, we thought the, the transcription repressor ISER was interesting, so we picked that, and from there started to do all our molecular biology experiments. So this was 1996, and uh, everything was very mature, so we could do all these things. We could measure ISER mRNA by qRT-PCR, and the, the protein, we could uh, follow the, the activity of transcription factors by, by genetically engineering the cells with um, uh, reporter gene assays, we could knock down t uh, transcription factors, we could knock them in, in their wild type or as a dominant negative, and uh, we, could follow, we could check the, which signal transduction uh, components were involved, and the, the whole thing we do with these molecular biology tweezers, where, where the, the bliss is that we can take single molecules, we can see them, we can manipulate them. And uh, we ended up saying that gastrin uh, works through its receptor, we checked that, we had an antagonist towards the receptor so we could knock out the signal. We, we could show protein kinase C plays a role, protein kinase A. Transcription factor CREV1 is activated and that's required to activate ICER and ICER provides a negative feedback on CREV. Nice molecular mechanism, oh, we're really pleased and uh, we found out this with all this, this huge series of experiments and um, uh, the, the traces, to just to show you some of the traces we're working with, that we're really infatuated with our traces of molecules. That was one of the new things with molecular biology. We could get these G, uh, agarose gel electrophoresis uh, traces, and of course we need to translate them into data. So we look at what's the structure of the gene, which transcripts to expect, so we know that we knew there were four isoforms at the, the mRNA level and uh, these PCR products had the right size, so we could say these are the four isoforms, we, we can see them all. We check with um, glyceraldehyde uh, the hydrogenase, the housekeeping gene, and all this says that now we, we knew, knew, know what our data is, we can show that there is a dose response to gastrin, we can show that the temporal profile is as we expect. So we have sound, we have robust traces, we can <coughs> translate them into convincing data and uh, we can get this model. And um, the way we do it is we, we keep doing the experiments, we go always we go back to the preparation all the time, we do new things to it, we intervene in many different ways, we vary the interventions, we repeat, and in the end we stabilize some sort of set of data that we can then assemble into a model. So it's a, it's a nice claim, we could, we could uh, publish it, it was credible, and um, the, the molecular laboratory worked well, it took some years to set it up, but, but we could buy everything, we could buy all the reagents and all the cloning vectors and everything uh, we needed, so working unit, scientific objects and transformation, stable culture and st standardized infrastructure. It was available, it was doable. The thing was that ISER doesn't really explain how gastrin stimulates proliferation. So it, it dawned on us that the molecular biology laboratory wasn't really well suited to ask this type of questions and indeed the question wasn't asked by molecular biologists in the first place. It was asked by the physiologists. So maybe no surprise that the molecular biology laboratory wasn't really, didn't really uh, suffice. So we went on to build a large-scale data laboratory. So we realized we need, knowing just a few molecules doesn't really help. We need to know them all. So we, we, we went from our molecular biology laboratory to uh, the large scale. We had the microarray traces and we again infatuated as we are with traces. We jumped on these pseudo colors and said, yeah, this is our traces, this is our data. And then uh, talked to uh, 
started talking to computer scientists and saying, well, it's really got all these spots. They're really difficult to uh, interpret. We said, well, well, how did you do it before? Well, before we, we looked at these and then we, we stared at them a lot. Ah, the famous eyeballing method. Yeah, so, okay, so, yeah, and that's what we're trying with the microarray also, but it doesn't really get us anywhere. So eyeballing is out, and uh, the traces actually remain in the instrument to this day. In large scale, traces remain in the instrument, and we realized that what we uh, that the molecular biology we're doing we had a new name for it that was small scale. Small scale is a different world, or large scale is a new world where the traces remain in the instrument and where the data are data sets. We can portray them as heat maps or as profiles. It still doesn't really tell us a lot of, uh, to understand the molecular mechanisms. So to do that we need to produce the claims on biological function we really need to configure it with prior knowledge. So we need a new knowledge infrastructure and uh, with that we can start configuring our data sets with multiple to into multiple configurations and working models and in the end maybe synthesize some sort of claim or model. So molecular biology small scale transformed or, or recrafted into large scale or systems biology, it it moves the circle, the the, the way we work to produce claims. We still do a lot of intervention varying repeating. We do that. That's what we do to stabilize the claims. But now we're really focusing on, on these operations on the data set itself. So that is what Rune and I have been discussing and uh, had, had, we've come to, you know, synthesizes our current understanding of how how the process with scientific objects has changed. So, the process with so working with scientific objects has changed in the way I just explained. Now, the other two aspects, the working unit and the culture infrastructure, just to comment on that also. So, the working unit, obviously, as we all experience sitting here, both those of you who come from a wet lab to, to a dry lab, but of course also you working in the dry lab, is that in molecular biology it used to be the biologist, but that's what, all we did. We were in the, in the wet lab. We dealt with everything ourselves. In systems biology, uh, we're not self-sufficient anymore. So obviously, so that's why I'm working with, uh, with Miguel here, providing the, the computational, the dry lab side. So now we really, uh, the, the working unit and the workplace has changed considerably. And the other thing is this culture, infra or the, the, the infrastructure, so to produce these claims, it, there is no way we can go and read the literature about everything anymore. So we, we need everything in this uh, digital knowledge infrastructure. And um, that's when I came to Alfonso, some 15 years back. And I said, no, I got all these large scale data. I, I really, I, I can't make sense of them because the databases, knowledge bases are there's, I can't find what I need there. So we started um, building this, uh, to do the information extraction, particularly focusing transcription factor target chain information to, to contribute to build the, the digital knowledge infrastructure. And um, yeah, maybe also just to, sorry. So I've worked with a lot of people here then, Miguel, but also Martin Kralling and Florian Leiter and now Nuria. You're going to hear more about what uh, Nuria is, is doing right now. You'll hear more about it later in the semester. 
The novel, data, the novel infrastructure databases is maybe one of the really central aspects of the novel <coughs> infrastructure and the most difficult to build also, obviously. There's the data repositories, of course we had the genomic ones since the 1980s, but with functional genomics it really exploded. Because now, in the genome you can do once and for all, more or less. But the transcriptome is, of course, different for every preparation and every, every biological context, everything you do to it. And an even larger revolution, as Rune and I see it, is the re-engineering, obviously, of the knowledge, knowledge basis, of the knowledge infrastructure. Because now we find ourselves in a very different world of people, artifacts and institutions that handle the knowledge infrastructure. So we come from a text-centric infrastructure with the publications, journals, everything we, we read, we talk. Everything is, is, is natural language, how we speak and think. And, um, but now it's re-engineered to not to include, but also more or less solely in consist of digital objects, ontologies, controlled vocabularies, and uh, all of these aspects, it's a really, really different world compare, compared to how we used to deal with knowledge. <coughs> so, Infrastructure, as Runa already mentioned, it's not a new thing, so we have here in knowledge basis repository. So this is just really to say that uh, during, if we start in the, in the 70s and go on till now, obviously uh, all the time new infrastructures grow out of, of, of research. So cell lines, kits, the genome sequencing, uh, it, it's, it's nothing new, but what is new is, is the is or or it's it's nothing new, but there are now other aspects of the infrastructure that sort of play a role in current science. And now I'll just quickly summarize where we are now. So current work we're doing is both information extraction and systems approach. We're working on cancer drug response. Um, we started in the Trondheim group to, to predict drug response. And uh, obviously the networks that we're using, even though we just make them bigger and bigger, they still don't really explain satisfactorily what we want, neither for understanding nor for, for prediction. So that's why uh, we're still asking the question, how do cancer drugs work? We uh, have a cell line where we studied, we do transcriptomics <coughs> with the uh, drugs, we do a time, we've done a time course, we have a large data set with 11,000 differentially expressed genes. We want to use this to understand what's going on and to get better at predictive modeling. We're doing it in the way I've just talked. We are intervening with the data set or producing multiple configurations. And this is enabled by Miguel's RBBT workflow, who does the sandbox magics that allow for me to actually reach very far into this um, process of dealing with the scientific objects and trying to to get under the skin of the different configured working models that we put together in the end to put forward some claims. So, to summarize, I'll give the word back to you, Rune. <coughs> okay, um, I'll just very short, just remind the, what our intentions has been. So this is this is what we do. We try to write this story now to to have um, 
to make a, ca a case that these uh, changes happen that are of a uh, radical kind in the sense that the, and they are difficult to understand because all these changes happens are intertwined. Um, and one of the, the things we struggle with is also to name or describe these scientific objects to what extent they are of a different kind and how they are refigured or changed the very object that one reasons about and uh, because that's at the heart of the laboratory and it's also a question of, of the unit how this unit is to be understood um, we struggle also a little bit with, with that one because it's quite easy when it comes to the molecular biology as you could set it up it took a year but the infrastructure was so readily available that it could easily be done uh, and she knew how to do it she was confident she could just do it because she has been working in that type of environment before she could just set it up more or less of course difficult hard work and you did, don't really know if you managed to answer your epistemic questions but still it's of a different kind than the world she's living in now where all this somehow work of, of establishing this unit is a constant struggle and it has been for 20 years and it's still going on and I've been fascinated by how she has been working with quite detailed work of, of constructing these infrastructures of knowledge bases the very content, the very structure, turning herself into a curator, uh, working with uh, manual curators and working with you guys to extract it by other means, by text mining. And all that type of work is not <clears throat> where she primarily is, 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 is happy, so to speak. She just wants to be in the laboratory and find out stuff. But in order to do that, she has to, to somehow build this laboratory and it's 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 an extensive work far reaching out from 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 what she was used to as when i met her in the late 90s um, <clears throat> so it's this um this one thing i just wanted to to um comment on in the end that this is to, to view systems biology in this way is to view it as an aspirational. So it's, it's still a, a, a practice that one wants to create and wants to create in, to be so uh, well established and robust that you just could live in it, that you just could have that form of life and you don't have to worry about all that type of stuff that doesn't work so much. You just have to, you can just how know how the cell ticks and how it works um, and so what is part of, of the motivation and, and part of our question here is is the way of uh, in which we should understand this this um, uh, this life of living in the future not yet still established and uh, so our story reflects this is an ongoing decade-long work but it took that long decade-long work to establish the molecular biology laboratory as well to be a robust one that somehow is aware of, of a very mature kind <clears throat> so but as this spans over several decades and over generations sometimes we joke about the new generation being born as systems biologists without having have the experience of what it, where it came from at the practice. Uh, <clears throat> the nature of this uh, shift may possibly not be sufficiently understood and recognized and as the type of drama we sometimes feel it is. Um, <clears throat> and that might also happen because as an aspiration of practice you're always looking forward and you should look forward to what you want to establish 
uh, and to, to make this happen. And you imagine it as a something you work towards and that defines your um, work of the present to get there. But then we have been discussing what might happen that you are so um, focused on, on the future that you s more gradually just find yourself in this future that you are s seeking and starting to look back on the present in light of that future. So it's the perspective may gradually be turned upside down in the sense that existing practices may be seem incomplete or flawed and in need of being fixed in light of that future that you is not still established but you want to where you look and, and see what needs to be fixed in the present because you want to get somewhere else but then there's a problem in the in the present that is needs to be fixed but that problem is not necessarily a problem that needs to be fixed in a in a different type of style of reasoning but it is relative to the style of reasoning that you aim to establish um, so one of our concerns is is that some form of the what, what, what we have been focusing on and what we find is interesting here is, is one of the aspect is, as you mentioned, the knowledge basis or the ways in which that reconfigures the researcher's relationship to the collective knowledge of the field. It's a different type of relationship and it's also a change that comes with a change of trying to make a new style of reasoning. It comes with trying to make a new laboratory. And it's part of that struggle is also to reshape your relationship to the body of knowledge. That earlier we were in the molecular biology, us you would know all the literature of anything about Gastrin. And everyone who wondered about Gastrin, they could call Astrid or she could be a peer review of, of papers on, on the matter. She would know everything about this molecule or this hormone. But the whole body of literature that needs to be part of, of, of uh, uh, a full scale is, is a different type of relationship to that body of knowledge. And uh, uh, this is one of just returning to one of these 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 slides is it's a living in a different type of world and you need to reconstruct your your, th your way of thinking and this is just one of the many aspects that needs to be done simultaneously and just like looking at these objects uh, turning attention like Reinberger asks us to do to turn attention to to the object we work with in, in which that somehow is um, is, uh, is part of how we make uh, knowledge claims by means of all these, these, these very specific things. Um, it's not a conclusion, but it's a reminder more or less of what we're, we're, we're trying to get at, that this is, is understanding systems biology not as a thing but as a process as something that is under construction <laughs> and less mature than the degree of molecular bi biology was at, at, and still is but of a different kind a different type of, of laboratory style of reasoning and if that's the case that's why it deserves a different name <laughs> otherwise we wouldn't call it something else Uh, I'll just skip this, uh, and unless you want to have further, no. no? Thank you. Thanks. Um, this has been very interesting. Uh, I've seen. I think it. Um, it's given me a lot to think of, uh, especially things like uh, this iteration 
that you did in the molecular lab, it was going always back to the preparations and how we do it. Now it's the data set, it's the data, and sometimes even it's a little detached from what we were originally looking at. At some point you investigate a cell line, but then you spend the next uh, few years where you don't touch the cell line at all. You're just working on the data, working on the data sets. And this feeling of iterating over, and I think that's, uh, my experience working with you is something that you kind of brought from, I think, my, my feeling is that you brought it from your previous experience. But the way I work, when we work together, we do iterate a lot. And um, it, it's, it's sometimes about my, like my uh, usual way of doing things is I, I might apply a pipeline and then I'm happy with the result. But it's never like that with you. It's always going back. So it attest to this different culture that I think um, comes when when you change the uh, the working unit from a, from the molecular laboratory to the systems biology, I think you still you still have to th to keep thinking of of this iteration. What what is the object that you're working in? Sometimes it's the knowledge base that you're trying to purify, or the methodology of how you apply to your data, etc. Well, very interesting. I can open the the floor. I think we have time for uh, for some questions. If you you can ask the question, I'll, and I'll repeat it so it gets uh, logged in. So. Uh, is there any questions in the audience? Yes? Thank you. Thanks for having a wonderful talk. It was very insightful and very thought-provoking. Um, I'm going to have to apologize because this is, I feel this question is going to, this is the kind of question that is better if you discuss it over a cup of coffee. You want me to eat it? Yeah. yeah. So as I was saying, I, I feel this is the kind of question that you have to discuss over a cup of coffee or a glass of whiskey. But um, the question here is about the theoretical framework that you're using. Because you mentioned that you were having issues when it comes to understanding and defining the objects. Um, and, and I was quite surprised when you mentioned that the smallest unit that you were using was the working unit so for, on, on the lab. And you, at, at no point there was a mention of the individual. So the individual people working within that working unit. And I was constantly thinking about what if we move the micro level from the working unit to the individual, right? Because then you were putting examples uh, of the, like the, the objects, is something that one uses to achieve one's objectives, for instance. You were using one, like as an individual. And you were mentioning different people out there, um, Astrid, Miguel, whatever. Uh, instead of talking about the working unit, you were talking about people. And, and I think that this is particularly important because I believe that the theoretical framework comes from the 1990s, if I understood you correctly. Uh, but nowadays, uh, because of everything that's going on in the world and, and how easy it is to, to talk uh, with people from different communities, contexts, I feel that there is a possibility of including a lot of epistemological or ontological viewpoints in within a single working unit. And I think BSC is a perfect case in point in, in that. So I'm just, so the question here is, have you thought about uh, reducing the micro level of that theoretical framework to the individual? And, and if so, what would you think the consequences would be when understanding the objects? A lot of things. Thank you very much. Uh, it's it. It. I, I'm not sure if I can understand that all that, um, but I, I think there's parallels here that fascinates me from the history of physics moving large scale to big science. Uh, how that changes the the the. Um, lines of division of work and you get theoreticians and you get experimentalists that was one person and it's not just two persons but there are many experimentalists and there are many theorists <laughs> and, and but there there's still one one type of big working unit the the big laboratory they're all sharing and in this setting um, that working unit troubles me 
to understand how that works in the systems biology setting. Because how can one draw that type of borderline, borders? Um, because it's, it's still, but I still think it makes sense to speak of a work unit. Because it's at least uh, understanding the laboratory uh, integrity of what that type of work is, is connected to uh, a, a work unit that, because truth claims answers to that work unit. You have to make your claim towards your peers by reference to that unit or that experimental system. But what, how that translates into the systems biology, if we are trying to understand that as a laboratory, I think that's challenging for some of those reasons. But I'm not sure if I understood all the, the aspects. Um, yeah, and I, and I think and I do agree with what you're saying. I, I don't think that the working unit should be removed from mm -hmm. the framework, uh, but maybe understanding it as a meso level rather than a micro level uh, could help. Uh, but I, I also, but I see your point, and and again, this is a very complex thing that we that is we're and, probably not going and, to solve and today. Is, and the flexibility of the scientific objects, and how one somehow because that the scientific objects is always rep. Uh, um, um, have always a reference to an epistemic object. But when you use the same object, the same data set, for different type of epistemic objects, you're reconfiguring the whole line of argument, the way scientific objects are transferred from what is at least supposed to be in biology, the preparation when it needs to be there, by the reference back to life in some way. But then you have different type of preparations and different type of data, data sets. And, and the way to, to configure that and how to theorize that is, is, well, at least I think it opens up a way of, of trying to do that by, by means of doing this, where the objects are, 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 are always particular in terms of a specific epistemic object. Okay, thank you. I'll think about it and I'll let you know next time I see you. But we can take the coffee. <laughs> So um, thanks for the interesting talk. Um, I was fascinated with well, regarding the the new digital um, knowledge infrastructures, and I was it was just a quick question regarding how do you see uh, the role that, for example, new uh, language models who are trained with this uh, biological knowledge which are kind of different from ontologies or libraries, which are not so, you know, interactive. They're not so conversational. So I think there's, there's this sense of kind of agency added to these models that you can talk and ask with that might also change a lot how you interact with knowledge. So um, it, it was just like, you know, because, may, for example, Astrid knows a lot about gastrin, but imagine if you see this model as a person that knows kind of a lot about a lot of things it you know it it has a uh, like also has an effect you know, on how you see this this embedded biological knowledge. So how do you see this this playing a role in this new? Yeah, so obviously I think so. Miguel and Nuria are much better placed than me to answer that question. But uh, I, I, I'm I'm sure this is something coming up on the horizon that will change things a lot. The question will still remain. If we expect that it will represent knowledge much richer, much more complete, uh, the, the maybe one of the really central questions is how to follow the, to know where it comes from, and so the confidence. Mm -hmm. So which part of it, because that's the first thing we do when we read a paper, you know. The first thing we do is we look at the pictures, at the traces. Does this look nice? Does it look convincing? No? Well, just throw it away. Look to the next. Mm -hmm. so, so the central thing is always to how to sort all these claims. Which ones do we believe, which are really relevant for what we're trying to solve? And that maybe, I don't know, how, how, is, that, uh, is that an open question? Or, or are you beginning to see also how that will be resolved? No, it's uh, no. It just made me think the your question that um, 
like in the in the setting you describe, you have this object you want to investigate. You have these um, tools or instruments where you get your your traces, your data. But the instrument was never in question. Now we have new instruments that we don't really yet understand. We have language models. We don't exactly know how they work, how reliable they are, what's the how they acquire and communicate, and how to use them. And they become an object of study themselves. So you, you, you have a whole, the object is no longer maybe a, 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 a thing in nature, but the, the instrument in itself that you're investigating. And you first need to understand it. And a lot of the people I think in, in your lab are actually iterating over an object that is the actual model, which I think it's weird. It's different from what happened before. And it was also very interesting, your appreciation that, like Runa said before, it was a person that knew everything about casting. Now it's something, a model, that might get to a point where it becomes like an, a person that also knows everything about some topic or even every topic. And that, that would be a curious, a very curious thing to happen. <laughs> um, I don't know if you want to say anything else in that regard, or maybe we can, I don't know if we can take another question. We're on the top of the hour. Well, I think we're going to leave it here. Thank you very much. Let's give them another round of applause. <laughs>